Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of La Rouge Rugby Podcast, where we talk about real Canadian rugby. I'm Stu Hardy, joined as always by Derek Brissett. Derek, we've had a lot of MLR games happen this weekend, but you know, because of European time zones being what they are, you were able to get in to watch the Premiership Final, where I hear your beloved Saracens were able to just sneak a win at Twickenham. Hey, hey. You just sneak a win, dominant, dominant performance. We just, uh, you know, when uh, when Sale was winning twenty five to twenty three, it's right where we wanted them, anyways. Uh, we knew this is like Elliot Daly coming on late in the game, uh, Van Zyl uh, with an absolute. I don't even know why they needed to go to TMO. The clearest grounding ever, just absolutely the clearest grounding ever. Um, I don't even know why they went to the TMO, but yeah, da- uh, Daly and Van Zyl kind of, you know, coming in clutch at the end of the game. Uh, it was beautiful. The Saracens are back to the, uh, you know, once again at the rightful place as the best team in England. Um, and, uh, you know, you just, uh, you just love to see it. Um, it was delightful. It's, it's a lot of fun watching a rugby team that you cheer for continually to succeed constantly in everything that they do so it's uh it, it is rather nice to see it balances balanced out a few other sporting disappointments for myself this weekend obviously we'll talk about the arrows game but uh my uh aussie rules football team then we had our uh the toronto dingoes we had our first game this week and uh we we lost to uh to Grand River Gargoyles. So that was a bit of a tough start. But the Saracens were there to, you know, pick me up and make me feel better about uh all my sporting endeavors in my life. And I'd be amiss not to mention the two European nations of Ireland and South Africa taking part in the URC <laughs> final, yeah. with uh Munster denying the Stormers at the death as Munster claimed their fourth. Well, it's their first URC title in the fourth in the old Celtic League Pro 12, Pro 14. Yeah. That title. So <laughs> congratulations to them. Yeah, um, congrats yeah. on winning whatever it is your league is yeah. at this yeah. point in time. And in a brief transition, keeping it in Europe, but bringing it back to North America, it was also had like the Monaco Grand Prix and the Indy 500. Uh my team, McLaren, representing both of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, n- not as bad as it could have been in uh, Monaco. You know, both uh, Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri picking up points, finishing 9 and 10th. And in the Indy 500, uh, unfortunately, Felix Rosenquist uh, hit the wall. Marcus Ericsson hit Pato Award, denying him what could have been his first uh, Indy 500 victory. Um, but Alexander Rossi finishing in the top five and Tony Kanan um, calling time on his illustrious motorsporting career, finishing 16th. And I believe he's currently now 30 something in the uh, IndyCar Championship, but he won't be adding any more points. Yeah. To that. It's a really big, anyway. big sport weekend, man. NBA playoffs are great. The Stanley Cup playoffs are great, too. Yeah. Um... MLR playoff races are heating up or really cooling off, depending on your point of view on life. Um, if you're a glass or which conference you're supporting. Yeah, exactly. If you're it depends if you're a glass, uh, you know, a glass half empty or half full type of person, I guess, for the MLR playoff races. Um, but you know, it's uh it's it's big, it's a really uh it's a great time to be a sports fan, really. There's a there's a lot yeah. going on right now. Yeah, speaking of the playoff races, there was definitely one oh, team. Canada that confirmed... won the double IHF World Championship too. That happened. Nobody ah, yeah. in Canada cares about that tournament, though. Not a single Fair person enough. cares about that tournament. But Did anyone won. even know about that tournament? No, exactly. That's how good we are at hockey. We just we win tournaments we don't even care about. Right. Yeah. World Juniors, double IHF. Is... No, the World Juniors we care about. The double IHF Worlds, where we send all of the Arizona Coyotes and Buffalo Sabres. Um, <laughs> who um, all the players that are nowhere near good enough to compete in the Stanley Cup playoffs all go to uh, hang out uh, and uh, have a couple beers in a European city and casually just win a hockey tournament against you know the best nations in the world. So, all right. Anyway, let's keep it in North America and the MLR playoff race because one team definitely confirmed their standing in um, the playoff race, and that was New England who. 
Now with only three rounds left and with 20 points ahead of second place Old Glory DC, they have confirmed that they will be hosting the Eastern Conference Final and also getting that bye week in the Championship Series. Conversely, we all knew the writing was on the wall, but Toronto are now mathematically eliminated from playoff contention, the first team in the East to do so. And let's talk about the game that was. So it started off as you would expect. I think it was a uh, only a penalty that um, began the scoring for Toronto with uh, Peter Nelson stepping up to chip it over. And I've yeah. seen some people complaining, like, why didn't they kick to the corner and go for the line out and the driving mall? To which I replied with, have you seen the Arrows driving mall this season? I was going to say, the Arrows fans were very opinionated on this decision. It's uh, one way or the other. I mean, on one hand, I mean, what do you have to lose at this point in the season? Um, yeah, that's true. You might as well try it. Um, the mall's not going to get better unless you keep trying it. Um, on the other hand, it's like we've, I mean, you're the last place team in the East. You're um, playing the best team in the East, by far the best team in the East. Um, a team that historically obliterated you the last time you met. Um, nice to get the scoreboard ticking over early, get some positivity. Um, at least that's what I was thinking at the time when I watched it. Um, when I watched it happen, I was like, oh, okay, like, you know, get a nice little positive moment, like two minutes into the game, get, you know, get the, you know, the boys feeling good about themselves. And uh, then Slade McDowell ruined it like 30 seconds later. So, yeah. I mean, that was pretty much the general tactic from New England. It's like, if you concede points, you score points as soon as you can afterwards. Yeah, so uh, That's a good tactic to have, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Slay McDowell and Kieran McClay uh, then leading to 12-3, uh, as well as Mills Sanarivi and Tavita Sole, uh, before Toronto was eventually able to respond. So... You know, at this point, New England already have the try bonus point. Mm -hmm. And then we get over to um, the Arrows. And interestingly, they have the penalty advantage. They don't go for the post, but they also don't go for the scrum either. It's a tap and go, which is, you know, something we haven't really seen a lot in MLR. I want. I do want to talk about this later, but I feel like we should just finish the recap. For... Yeah. So... Getting the ball forwards, getting over, and then Will Grant fires a fantastic pass into Tarsi, who's running onto it, and it's just able to sneak to one side of the post. But I, I honestly thought he was going to run straight into the post. <laughs> I do a, a Toby flood, but that, that, uh, that used to be legal. Yeah, <laughs> but he was able to get over to the right hand side, dot it down. And the points suddenly come into the arrow's favor and it gets converted. As so, we suddenly have the arrows 13 points ahead, which means they're already doing better than the last time they faced New England. Three jacks so, 13 points ahead. Yeah, if the arrows were 13 points ahead, we'd be ecstatic about this at this point. Yeah, as it, I said, as in Toronto, we're on 13 points, ah. so, and, and New England were 13 points ahead of them at that point because they were 26. So yeah, as in, um, but yeah, as in, I to be honest, I if I was a Free Jacks fan, I'd be completely devastated from this weekend. <laughs> I mean, yeah, fine, you got the champion, you got the championship game pretty much in sight. You've got the conference final done and dusted. But I mean, come on, this is a team that you only allow to score one try, and then you let one player from that team score twice. If yeah. if I uh, if I was their head coach, I would be giving them the hair dryer treatment <laughs> all this week. What's that? Um, you know, in the Mighty Ducks, the first game that Bombay coaches, and they have to play the Hawks, and the score of the game is like twenty three to one after the second period, and like the coach is like, "What are you spy?" And the the coach of the Hawks is like, "What are you smiling about against this team? We should be winning by twice as many." Um, yeah. I feel like that's kind of like the picture you're trying to paint here. Is it, yeah. So you th you think the Free Jack should have repeated the the performance and is that well, what you're getting at? Well, that's a bit. The Arrows injury list, I'm pretty sure, was 14 
uh, coming into this game. So the match day twenty, uh, they have the match day twenty three. Then you have the injury list and that takes to the thirty seven, which I'm pretty sure is the entire Arrows roster. So, yeah, I'm thinking that, yeah, you know, uh, I th- knew that England maybe were resting on their laurels. I mean, what they scored fifty points in the first half the last time they played Toronto. So right. why why does this why why are we making this sound like we're breaking down like a Canada All Blacks game or something? There's a few Kiwis and any anyway, yeah, the arrows uh, continue. The yeah, arrows fall for. Uh, Another try early in the uh, second half by Sanarivi, um, leading the advantage to 18. Uh, but then again, it was Tarsi again who scored, barging in close. Right, and then, like that was those were a few uh, poor tackles from New England not to be able to stop him. Uh, but you know, New England were able to get um, four more tries under their belts to either side of the um, hydration break, mm-hmm. and then. And you know the arrows still showed hard; they were still pushing towards the end, but uh, was just brought into touch. And the final score was New England, a miserable, pathetic fifty-seven. Yeah. Toronto twenty. And um, yeah, as in just dis- disappointing. You can't put in an all-time performance against the arrows, uh, like six weeks prior, and then just falter like this. That's What's the, uh, the the season series aggregate score? What is it? One hundred and twenty eight to fuck to twenty five. <laughs> uh, hundred and yeah, hundred and thirty seven. Oh, hundred. Oh, sorry. See, I'm I'm terrible at math. Well, I mean, I guess on on one hand, it's like yeah, it's first place team in the league, the clear or first place team in the Eastern Conference, the clear clearly the best team in the East. We'll talk about that later too. Um, but clearly the best team in the East against, you know, obviously the arrows I've been dealing with their injury situation and stuff and they've been struggling all year. So, I mean, the, re- the results kind of a little bit as expected, I think, um, I think there's definitely in this match, um, it's a lot of the same things that we've, you know, been talking about all year, right. Uh, you know the the set piece struggled um from mm-hmm. uh, for a lot of the game, uh, what both li- like you know offense uh, with the ball in attack in an attacking position and defensively as well. Um, New England obviously you know took uh, it looked like I know they've done it a couple times uh, in the year, but they were also you know trying out things like I think they rocked a uh, they went with like a ten man line out at one point in the game too. Um, like there was just, uh, you know, throwing a lot of different looks at the arrows. Um, yeah. those often kind of ended with tries. There was also that, um, that Santa Rivi try that was like, you know, the give and go play with the scrum half down the short side, yeah. um, that resulted in a try. So they're definitely bringing out a little bit of a mixed bag of attack. I think, you know, obviously part, part of the struggles in this game too, is just new England's just that good. Um, yeah. right. Like there's, you got to give. I mean, like we're you're we're like joking around about like the score line, at least in comparison to the last game. But yeah, like they're they're that good. Like it's um they they put up these those points and stuff. Um, they can score tries from like I mean, they score tries from everywhere, right? Like they're scoring tries off set pieces. They're scoring tries off of open play in attack. That um, welcome back, Bowden Walker, by the way. Um, yeah. But- Cross field kick to Philemon that he leapt up and grabbed over uh, O'Leary's head. Uh, that was incredible. Um, that like that's just a, a try again. That's just like, I mean, I don't know. Like I don't know what you do at that point. Like it's an incredible play, right? Um, and there's there's kind of a lot of that. I think I there's the thing I think that really and obviously defensively they're amazing too yeah but i think i think a big part of this game too that i think was a little bit of like that um a bit of a cause of like frustration i think um from like for the arrows from the arrows point of view and i'm gonna just pull something up just to make sure i get all these times right we talked about um we briefly touched on the uh the, the decision at the start of the game 
um, to go for, for points instead of, you know, going to the corner, um, you know, and obviously, you know, there's some people that, you know, there's some people that didn't like that. There's some people that did like that. I'm kind of indifferent on it, to be honest with you. Um, the thing that I think really drags that decision down though, is one of the biggest issues for the arrows in this game was the restart. And or any kickoff in general, really, um, including like, you know, the opening kickoff and the uh, the first and the second half as well. Um, mm-hmm. But like if you kind of look at it, it's like the arrows, I think, like I said, I understand the idea of wanting to get the scoreboard ticking over early. Right. Get so especially considering the previous result between these two teams, get some positivity going. Right. Get like, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, get the boys feeling good about themselves early on. Um, I understand the idea of wanting to do that, but you can't turn around and, you know, go up three, nothing, and then turn around, not win the next, not win that restart and then concede a try within three minutes. Right. And then new yeah. back out in front front. The next time the arrows, uh, get an opportunity to score, they put points back on the board. It's another penalty from Nelson. Um, uh, then, uh, you know, Sole scores a try in under six minutes after that. Um, Tassie, right. Scores his first scores, the arrows first try of the game. That's at 40 minutes, right, right on the stroke of halftime. And we've, you know, we've constantly talked about how big that can be of a momentum swing, right, Stu? So like mm-hmm. it's, you know, if you score at the end of halftime, halftime ended 26-13, right? That's a it's a 13 point lead. It's a it's a good, it's a healthy lead, but it's not like an insurmountable lead. You're still in the game at 26-13, right? Yeah. So you'd be like, that could be a big momentum builder. You want to continue to build off of that. And Santa Rivi scores a try in the 41st minute. Right. And it's yeah. it, it, again, it just kills all the momentum. Right. And then, you know, you keep going to Tassie again um, with his second try, the one where he ran into the post. Right. And so he scores that try at 51 minutes. Right. O'Leary converts it at the 52nd minute. And then Slade McDowell scores a try in the 53rd minute. It's like there is no. And again, like you got to give the Free Jacks credit where credit's due. Like they're the best team in the Eastern Conference. Right. But. It's all those those like little things. It's like it's not always just about to me. It's not just about like if you make mistakes in rugby because it's like as like the game of rugby is basically two teams trying to force the other team to make as many mistakes as possible, right? Um, and as we've talked about, it's like some mistakes will happen, right? But it's you know how you bounce back from those mistakes is you know, is what really matters. Right. And sometimes though, too, it's also, it's like when you make, but also when you make those mistakes is also really important. And it's like this game, I think it was like every time the arrows had something positive going for them, new England was right there to just snatch it away. And it often came in the form of new England winning the restart after the arrow scored and immediately going down the pitch and, uh, or even winning the restart after the second half. Cause I believe new England had the second half kickoff. If I remember this correctly. Um, but like immediately going down um, the pitch and scoring on the Toronto arrows who were just, you know, a minute ago feeling, you know, maybe feeling a little bit of positivity because they just scored on new England. Right. And it, it never got to like a linger. You never got to like, you know, feel good about yourself um, because it's like those those moments and those minutes that are immediately follow uh, immediately follow a team putting points on the board um, can be a really big deal in a game, right? Like that's where the momentum really that's where the momentum really does swing, right? Is how you teams respond after scoring plays, and New England did not allow Toronto to gain any momentum with anything that they any type of positivity that they put in this game, right? If um, the arrows got a breakdown steal, they kept that. Oh, it would be like, Oh, here's the kick. And here's Potros is going to leap into the third row of the stands to keep the ball alive. Right. And you would have, 
things like that happening all game. Um, if New England gave up a penalty, they'd get the ball back on the next play, right? And they never, yeah, they never let the arrows continue to build off of that momentum, and the arrows n- never did, right? And I think, like, yeah. I think up like the restarts and the way that they and what happened immediately after every arrows score in this game, I think, is kind of what ultimately led to New England winning. Um, but hmm. at the end of the day, man, like watching this again, like New England's so good. They're, yeah, so, I think, they're so good. I think the but this is the thing, New England were also incredible like last year as well. They have the long they had the longest they're better. winning streak. They're currently on pace to match it this year. Yeah. Um and I think, you know, and because there's the um docu series that's currently on the rugby network. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the first episode, they were talking about, you know, coming in from last season, making the conf- uh, conference final, and then losing, and then seeing their um, eastern rivals lift the shield. Uh, I think there is a like deep um, in not instinct, um, deep understanding within the Free Jacks of. Yeah. Like we can give no quarter. Oh, this is this is this is the business end of the season. Oh, um, but to get there, we have to do this, and they have done it phenomenally all the way throughout. And I, th- I think, and I think, yeah, as in like that mentality of being so close and yet so far last year is like it's like yeah, you know, you did uh, thirteen games unbeaten, cool, and you still didn't lift and the shield what? yeah um yeah no i i completely i would agree with that assessment too and they obviously you know they obviously went out and built their mm-hmm. like you know identified what they need on their roster and went out and made some massive additions to the squad most of them in the form of canadians which is something that as much as we might begrudgingly say in moments like these, we do love to see teams leaning on Canadian oh, stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, Andrew Quatrin getting the uh, uh, well, final try Quattrin? of the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Quatrin, Keith, Keys, um, Young. Uh, who else did they pick up in the middle of the, in the off season? To Lesage, Lesage. Yeah, thank you. Um, like, there's all these like you know big name can to go along with the complement of Canadians that they already had there. Um, right. And so they, they made a lot of like really big um, signings that really helped them. And I think they're better than than they were last year. Um, right. They're playing with the yeah. ball a lot more than last year, I think, which I think is also is just helping them a lot. Right. Um, and when they're playing with the ball, they're very, you know, you kind of watch this game. It's like they are so, so fast. Yeah. Um. Like it's right. It's it's one of those teams that it's like if you move the ball well, nobody can really run as fast as the ball can move. Yeah. If you know how to move it, right. Yeah. And like you watch, um, like McClee at scrum half was just like man, like that ball was every time that went into a rock, like that was out before, before the arrows could get two guys to it. Um, like it yeah. was, it was in- incredibly quick. Um, McClee and Potros were just opening up gaps everywhere. Um, with like the how quick the ball movement was. Um, everybody was running really good lines. Um, and like the the arrows just the arrows defense just couldn't keep up with the speed of the attack. There was obviously that um that Mitch Wilson try, uh, where they they had the line out on one side of the pitch win the line out and it was just like what three passes to get to Wilson uh, on the wing and he scores right yeah. and it was but like you could see like all the different lines that you know flankers and like the centers were running and just um to open up like every hole and every pass was just perfect um mm-hmm. but like they are like they're just firing on all cylinders from an attacking standpoint right now and it's like when it's in full flight um, it can be incredibly painful to watch, um, but when it's happening to other teams, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, this was a, a painful example, and but also it's like yeah, their defense doesn't give you much at all, man. Like it, like there's 
Um, the two tries that Toronto scored were great tries. They really had to work for those tries. Yeah. Um, like they had, and uh, Tassi got them, but um, back to your, to, to your original point of, I totally agree with you in saying that they're playing, like they have some unfinished business and, and, you know, in looking at a lot of other sports too, right. There's a lot of cases where teams, you know, that were like, say, you know, on the verge of some greatness as I like, had to lose first. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of those cases and it's like, it's, it is, it is starting to kind of feel that way with the, uh, with the free Jacks as the season's gone on and they just keep getting better and better um, with, with each and every game. Right. Spencer Jones was also, that's a Canadian that we forgot that. Meant yeah. That, uh, oh, was also a team. There's a lot, they made a lot of great pickups and um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal game from, um, from new England. And, you know, they're, they're definitely the favorite to win the East. Um, mm-hmm. They they could probably make you could probably give them a good case to be the favorite to win the Shield too, but um, Stu, we any, shall any have thoughts, to see any thoughts on on all of that? I do kind of want to talk a little yeah. arrow strategy things and stuff before the end of the uh... yeah. I I think uh, so. Speak uh, first of all. Once say just even though about like the new guys they picked up uh, for New England, do we also have to remember the players that they've uh, oh all the guys that were already retain? there? Yeah, yeah. Even oh. even the guy that left and then came back, yeah. Bowden Walker. Oh, that's he's, so good. Well, I mean, I hate that that yeah. they did that. I'm so annoyed. I don't yeah. like hate that they did that. I'm just like they can obviously do that. I'm just like as a fan yeah. of an Eastern Conference team in this league, I am so mad at that. Move. Um, which is like the yeah. most respectful thing I can say about that move, really. Yeah. Um. But yeah, as we've mentioned on countless other games that have happened this season, the Arrows have been hemorrhaged by their ever-growing injury list. The fact that they are limited on the number of international players they can have in a game. Um, it doesn't, does, that really doesn't help when no. you have an injury list. As It's something I haven't really thought of, but it's like when you have an injury list that's this big, and then you yeah. also have guys that could possibly be healthy, but they can't play because of the low international slots, too. Yeah. It stings. Yeah. But I think this was also a good um, experience, more, well, I should experience more like bleeding of players that yeah. you can look at to have in the arrows like next season, yeah. depending on their um, capabilities. So obviously having. You know, Will Grant and Cole Brown in this game instead of with Brody away injured. Um, Connor Grindle getting his first start as well. Liam Bowman getting his first start. Yeah. As well. Um, and, you know, we're still having this with um, Sam Malcolm uh, still injured. We're having this Nelson O'Leary change at 10 and 15, given the different. Um, opportunities for them uh Owen Rattan he had a fantastic game uh the most tackles made of any arrows player uh Deshaun Bowen despite being on the bench had the most uh defenders beaten for the arrows uh Travis Larson you know ever since he's come back from injury yeah, he's Larson's been doing been the numbers great yeah the last like uh, four weeks uh, 22 attacking breakdown arrivals, eight uh, defending breakdown arrivals shared with Lucas Rumble for that. Um, I believe O'Gorman, too, to shout out some of the other Canadians. I think he was uh, among yeah. the leaders for New England as well. Yeah, he uh, he led for attacking breakdown arrivals for yeah. the Free Jacks. And yeah, it's great. You know, as we said, great to see Canadians doing well in the league, even if it is against uh, your preferred team. And so I think from a like arrows managerial standpoint, it's now we've got three games left of the season. Obviously, injuries are hampering any possibilities of like free plans you want to have. But with the guys you've got, having them being playing in certain positions, having them getting their starts, seeing how they do, this is going to basically be their opportunity to present themselves to say, "I should have a contract next year." 
Uh, and, you know, obviously the Arrows will be getting, I believe they're currently third for the uh, draft pick after, of course, Miami will be number one. Um, but, you know, it should be time to be looking towards um, the academies, the Atlantic selects, um, anything going on in BC with the Coastal Cup coming up. I've seen like who's uh, someone to keep an eye out for coming into that selection process. But I think, yeah, I mean, obviously now it's mathematically confirmed the arrows are out of playoff contention. Yeah. Now you can definitely turn ahead to 2024. You know, currently the Arrows are now going to have 10 international slots. So international players that have performed well, you can say like, hey, we've now got the numbers that if you want to come back next year, we're going to have you being able to play uh, more in the starting 15. And, you know, just get, but again, the injury list, the ever growing injury list is obviously dampening things. And, you know, um, fortunately, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even Shea Kerry, who was thankfully able to start this game, he's been out injured, and he was injury cover for an international player. So it's, you know, this team is cursed, but, you know, if we can find a warlock, a shaman, uh, <laughs> and any anything from D&D who can help with this. Paladins. Yeah, paladins on their holy crusade against whatever is ailing the arrows yeah. hopefully that can be done in the off season and come 2024 we'll be seeing some of these players again um and hopefully under better circumstances right yeah. i think that's an i think that's enough of new england and toronto let's talk about the four I remaining think, mlr games of this round i have one more toronto thing though if you want uh, all right but it's gotta be quick it's gotta be okay I, I I do agree with all um, with basically most of what you were saying there. Looking aside from like you know you got to look forward to next year and stuff, and you know it's time for uh, Tim Matthews to put on the Joker makeup, snap, snap the pool cue, and be like, "Hey, we're having tryouts and uh, figure out who wants to be here next year." Um, but the other thing I, I had a question is like we have strategically for games. So I'm assuming they're they're still obviously going to try to win these last three games, but. We've been on the arrow set piece like the whole year, right? Yeah. And probably deservingly so. Should the arrows just tap and go? Off uh, the for, for, for the rest, of, for the rest of the season, like, yes, yeah. Like so, like the the Tassies. So, like you had um, Tassie's first try. Um, the arrows, I think, what was it? A line of scrums, scrums or line outs, but it's like, they had a couple set piece opportunities. New England took a couple penalties and eventually they were just like at eh, tap and go. And that's the play they scored on. Yeah. Right. So I'm like, like, there's part of me that's kind of like watching this sometimes. And it's like, um, the whole year, the line out hasn't been able to punch anything in. Right. The, the scrum, um, has been good in some games, but it's been a little hit and miss over the course of the year. But like, I don't know, maybe just you know when I said this have to be quick. Yeah, I was like, there's a third option, right? Is you can tap and go. Like, I don't know if yeah. you're doing it. Yeah, that as in like it's clearly showing the results, and especially when you consider all the other options the arrows have, the uh, scrum has been like hit and miss the driving more from the line out hasn't been working yeah you can kick for points but then you're just falling back on to mishandling the restart and potentially letting the opposition score again so yeah tap and go you know get it's... at least an extra 60 seconds yeah. um from that like, try and yeah like i'm not there. saying tap and go from like your own end or something but like if you're like... i mean yeah. If it works, I mean, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not complaining if but, it works. Yeah, but I mean, like, hey, if you're within the 22 and, like, the lineout's not working, um, that was the big criticism of that decision at the start of the game was that it people think that it doesn't show any confidence in your set piece. So if 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 that's not there, like, then yeah, just a go. different option yeah. off a penalty and you score. All right. So I don't know. All right. I, all right. All right. right. Let's, let's move on. Okay, so we have the other games that happen in uh, this round. This is also the final round without a uh, full complement of games. So for the next three rounds, we'll be having six games every weekend. 
Love so first up, we have DC versus Seattle. You have Seattle currently in the driving seat to get either first or second in the West. Currently second, but they are in dire need of getting a win and hoping that San Diego take a loss just to be able to get on even legging. So they knew what they need to do. DC, you know, full Canadian compliment. That was always great to see in the lineup, but ultimately it was Seattle that knew what they needed to do and they were the ones to lay down the marker um, for San Diego. The final score, DC 14, Seattle 41. Also, this I think this is the first appearance this year of uh, Reed Watkins on the bench for Seattle. So congratulations to him. Glad to see him back uh, playing for the Seawolves in MLR. Also not a Canadian, but shout out to uh, Danny Tusatala who got his 50th, yes. 50th cap in Old Glory's 50th game and has been the starter in the starting scrum half in every single game that they've played. Um, that was from James Dealey on, at, uh, at MLR Stats. Um, I think I saw that earlier today or Sunday, but that is super cool. So yeah, uh, that, congrats, that is congrats incredibly today. impressive. That's, yeah, it's super cool. And now, next up, we have a game in which the Eastern could, team couldn't lose because it was entirely Western. It was Houston versus Chicago. And this was a complete uh, mismatch from all predictions. Uh, very, well, other very than one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very closely contested. Um, yeah. You know, Rob Povey back into the starting lineup. Um, for Houston. Uh, Chicago had Lindsey Stevens as hooker as well. Um, yeah, Povey able to get a bunch of conversions and also was able to get a intercept try in that he intercepted the ball and then had to turn around 180 degrees to go back to score the try against Chicago. It was it was very strange to say the least. Yeah, uh, it, that build up. I love uh, because that was the, the kick over the top from Cardi. And then Card, he just kind of threw the ball away. And Povey looked, there's a brief moment where Povey like looks like he forgets what to do with the ball because he's so surprised that he has the ball. And then just yeah. off for an easy try. Also added five conversions for a total of 15 points from Povey in uh, what's probably, his, yeah, I was going to say probably his best game of the year. Yeah. Next up, we had Utah versus ATL. And Utah, you know, this is what we've been saying about the Western Conference all <laughs> year. It's the, you know, it's the toughest one. Uh, there's teams trying to stake their claim and make the playoffs. It is coming a very, very close race out there, and uh, Utah were able to uh, get the win that they so desperately needed because uh, Utah and Houston are currently on the same number of points, and. You know, it's the uh, number of wins that is currently putting Utah ahead. Uh, ATL, you know, they think they've think they kind of fallen off a cliff these uh, past few rounds, especially. They're currently, they're only five points adrift of New York. But, you know, those uh, opportunities are only coming fewer and fewer as we go on. There's only three rounds left. Okay. The final score from that game, Utah 28, Atlanta 12. And then we conclude the round with the Sunday Jack Shaw try. Don't forget. Oh that. yes, of course, Jack Shaw scoring a try for Atlanta. Unfortunately, not enough to get the job done as Utah scored fourteen points over Atlanta to do so. And the final game of the round: San Diego versus New York at Snapdragon Stadium. San Diego having uh, Jason Higgins, having Michael Smith, and uh, Justices Duru. Uh, playing New York, they had Quinn Nawadi and Andrew Coe. And again, it's Sandy, it's the West that wants to secure their spot in the uh, playoffs. Uh, San Diego knew that they could secure being in the playoff, in the championship, uh, championship series uh, with a win, with a bonus point win, sorry. And New York, you know, they're still struggling to just secure it but it just seems like other teams are doing worse in the east so they're got a little <laughs> bit of a cushion yeah. um so san diego knew what they needed to do final score san diego 36 new york 13 so in the current standings we have new england in the east guaranteed to host that eastern conference final 
Uh, Old Glory DC are on 33 points, New York on 32, and as I said, ATL on 27, NOLA on 26, Toronto eliminated currently at 14, and in the West, San Diego on 59 points. They are confirmed to be in the in the championship series, not in the conference final just yet, because five points adrift is Seattle, and then a further 11 points back is Utah and Houston, both on the same points, with Dallas and Chicago being eliminated. So, yeah, it's going to be a very exciting final three weeks. Well, it's um, so, it's, I think, yeah, Utah and Houston. I don't know, depending on East or West. What do you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, like I said, it's because it's so tight in the West, they can, uh, they need to win to secure their place. But in the East, it's, it's the like... East, I, the East needs to win, too. They just don't. They're, well, that's the thing. They're they, surviving they, because they have that cushion. Huh? They, have that, they have that cushion, though, because... They don't have any cushion in the East. There's like... No, no in the sense of... Five wins. Let, let me explain. Stop getting over yourself. And let me say it. So if... DC, so for example, DC played against uh, Seattle, and Seattle knows, like, right, we need to win if we want to stay in the playoff picture. So then they win and DC lose. And then New York see that and they're like, oh, okay, they lost. So we're okay. And we also saw the ATL lost. So we still have a bit of a cushion. And of course, Nola's not playing this weekend, so they can't change anything. So we still well, have a little bit of a brace. I mean, it's 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 still equally as tight. Like Nola could go from fifth. Oh, I guess maybe they Nola can go from like what fifth fifth to ah. They can't actually go from fifth to third. I'm bad at math. Like I've said numerous times on this podcast. But it's like the, from two to five. Like they're all still definitely in it. Like you said, Old Glory's at thirty three. New York's at thirty two. Atlanta's at twenty seven, and Nola's at twenty six. So that's our four teams fighting for base for two playoff spots. So yeah. that's incredibly close. So they all still need to win these games, but like literally if one team wins, like that that like that could be enough. Like you need to win once cuz everybody's like everybody's losing. I honestly feel for the Western Conference teams who every single one of these teams wins this week because they all play Eastern Conference teams. Um, well, Houston played Dallas or Houston played Chicago, excuse me. But like they all play Eastern Conference teams, and every single team in the Western Conference, except Dallas, who was on a bye week, and Chicago, who had the misfortune of playing another Western Conference team, they all won. So it's like, yeah. And and like honestly, like if you're Houston or Utah, like I don't know how you don't look at the standings and be like, Eastern Conference, can you please help us? Like, we just want like just one win from an Eastern Conference team against a Western Conference team. That's, that's, that, like, that's, that's all. The the Eastern Conference is stumbling into the playoffs, and the Western Conference is just, like, incredible right now. Like, it's, they're just, everybody's winning. Um, The schedule. Well, there's going to be some interesting maker, fixtures coming up this weekend, but we'll get onto that in a minute. Do, so, I mean, the rest of uh, the, before we get the last that, game of the season, we, have you seen yeah. the last game of the season? But we'll get onto that later. Sure. So let's talk about something that was announced for this weekend before we get into our predictions is that there will be vintage jerseys available for auction. And interesting that some are... Now, when you go on to the Dash website, which is where you can bid for all these items, there's a different... Uh, timelines given for each of these jerseys. So, for example, Atlanta has, at the time of recording, like four days left to go. So they Houston wore has... Theirs. They wore theirs on the weekend, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. They? Yeah, yeah, they did. They, but did. They, they didn't really call it a vintage jersey until right at the last second. Yeah. Uh, Houston then have theirs in two weeks' time. New England are wearing theirs... I'm assuming now on the last game because theirs is 21 days. And uh, Nola Gold just has an event in progress. It doesn't even say when they're going to be playing. It's a uh -huh. mystery. So you just got to keep your eyes peeled for that one. And interestingly, Utah doesn't have a vintage jersey. It has a rodeo jersey. 
so this and sure. the way you can identify that this isn't a vintage jersey there's no uh, collar like there is for the other ones and it's got and also giant... and also the rodeo silhouette yeah um, and yeah. i'll just say there's a giant red bull um painted on the chest or sublimated on the chest and not like red bull like the drink like i mean there's a, like a literally the bull is red well you say that when they announce their new partner for uh 20, the 2024 season as the uh, Austrian uh, energy drink manufacturer, then yeah, yeah maybe we see that. Nah, feel, I should have seen it. They have a sponsor on the jersey, though. I feel like Intermountain Health might be uh, disappointed if there's a, they're being upstaged by the giant Red Bull on it. Yeah. Well, it depends. We shall find out in that unlikely scenario. But of the jerseys that are available, Derek, we've had a chance to look over them. Um, with the exception of the arrows, because that is a very nice jersey. Because it's the best one. <laughs> which which one do you like the most? Uh well, yeah. I mean, with the exception of the arrows, is that what you're saying? Because the arrows is the yeah. best one. I love it. Yeah. Um, it's perfect. Uh it's it's one of those, man. Um, I saw a um post from World Rugby earlier this week, and they just posted all the jerseys from the 95 rugby world cup Mm -hmm. man rugby kit peaked in the nineties. That was, that was the peak. Um, everybody looked great. Even that fun, uh, that funky Canada one with all the different colored leafs and the number in a giant maple leaf and stuff. It still looks better than like 90% of kits today. And I, I love that the league, everybody's kit looks classic hoops solid colors collars it's brilliant um i do before i pick my favorite i do want to take a chance to take a shot at the new england free jacks who have used this opportunity to unveil the worst jersey that they've ever had in franchise in their franchise's history of great jerseys and i'm only doing that because you beat the arrows really badly this weekend and i feel like i need something to knock you down a peg um so this baseball jersey with a collar that you have unveiled is not very good and um you have at least six or seven better looking vintage jerseys in your repertoire already um so yeah the free jacks are uh, probably have the worst one um i so but beyond that if i can't pick the arrows yeah Literally, I think some of these teams, their best jerseys are these vintage jerseys. Houston's is incredible. Uh, Seattle's looks way better than anything they're wearing right now. Please go back to that green and blue color scheme full time, guys. Get rid of the black. I don't know what you're doing. Um, Dallas is perfect. Chicago's is cool. It's like the dark green. Um, if I got to pick which one, one which one? I know. They're all great. They're all great. Uh, if I got to pick one, though, other than the arrows, it's San Diego. I think San Diego's got the best one, um, partly because I love the uh, the black and red like str- like hoop stripes that they have going on. Um, I think it's be- definitely I think it's again, it's it's the best kit that I think San Diego's worn. Also, the it's the perfect illustration of how to make a sponsor logo work and integrate into your jersey um because the kings and convicts logo actually looks really cool and also gets me slowly thinking that kings and convicts rugby club would be a super cool name for an mlr team as well if the san diego ever decide to get rid of legion as a name um but yeah for me i think if i can't pick the arrows because that's obviously the best one um i'd go arrows san diego everybody else new england that's how i rank them Mm. i i gotta say i like um new york so that's very similar to i thought you were like new england's for a second no 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 i i think what really irks me about uh new england's is that they don't have the team logo on it it just has that that giant, as you yeah. said, baseball free. See, jacks. I think I think it's tough. I do think it's tough for New England because New England has made their whole brand based on these vintage style jerseys. So yeah. they, they, like I said, they they probably like out of every team in the league, if they've unveiled twenty jerseys, have the best overall collection of jerseys in the league, probably. Um, but they do the vintage thing all the time. Or I guess basically what these teams are doing, and I don't know. I guess, I guess they tried something different, but I don't know. It didn't work for me. No, I, I think it looks yeah, like a like baseball jersey with a collar. Yeah, 
Yeah, it, it looks like... Yeah, it, I think it would work as a t-shirt, but that's about it. Um, I also think Nola's is very good as well. Uh, and I suppose... But I suppose if I had to pick one, and this is the thing, I really like hoops, but I also like things that are just like clean and crisp as well. Yeah, And that has to be Chicago. Chicago's think, that's Chicago's best jersey by far. Yeah. By far their best jersey. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I'd say if if I was a neutral MLR fan, yeah. Uh, I would um after the arrows, obviously, I would go for Chicago. And if anyone's interested in bidding on any of these jerseys, you can do so at fans.winwith-com. Uh, starting bids, I believe, are 200 USD, except for the Arrows jersey, which is 200 Canadian. Also, as we've discovered doing this, is that you can also bid on signed locker plates for the Toronto Arrows. And starting bids are $25, with $10 increments after that. And it has all the players from the season in alphabetical order on the website. So... Make sure you get bidding on those as soon as possible. Right, now we move on to our predictions for round 16. Derek, we're kind of doing pretty well. You're doing better than me. 48 wins, 28 losses, and two draws. I'm on 44 wins, 32 losses. But we start with an all Eastern affair, ATL versus New England. Who have you got? Uh, I'm going to take New England. I think this is obviously we've just, you know, spent most of the show gushing about how they're the best team in the East, with the exception of the vintage jersey that they unveiled. But yeah, they're the best team in the East. You got to fall at some point. Yeah, exactly. So. That's the only mistake they've made all year. And I mean, it, I want to see New England win because if New England wins this game, their last two games are against Western Conference teams. So if they beat Atlanta this week, it'll mean they've went undefeated against their own conference, which is kind of a cool stat to be able to claim. So uh, I like to see them do it. And as you mentioned, um, when we were recapping the the week's action, Atlanta has been struggling a lot. So um, I think that's uh, that's probably going to continue for them this week, unfortunately. Big matchup up now. Oh, you didn't say your pick. You wrote your pick, so I thought you said your pick, yeah. but you didn't say it. On the- yeah, so I am also going with New England as well. I think... Uh, well, the sword of Damocles have been hanging over Toronto so far this season. I think it's now moving over to Atlanta and Nola as well. I think it's like it's now or never, but when you look at their opponents, it's more on the never side. So I'm going with New England. So speaking of uh, Nola, they are up next and they will be playing DC. They will be at home for this game. Uh, that, but. This, so it's going to be Nola in Nola. And I think, I don't know what time the kickoff is, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty hot in Toronto at the moment. I dare not think what it's like in uh, New Orleans at this point. I think it's going to be super humid. It's going to really affect the gameplay of both teams. Uh, and DC are pushing for that playoff spot as well. Um, and then again, Nola have been like hit and miss throughout the season. They've been, you know, conceding huge amounts, and then at the same time, they've um then demolished their opposition, as was shown with New York. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna go and clutch. I say this is gonna be another away victory. I'm going with DC. Yeah, I think it, it's funny because it's like you say, like Nola's been hit and miss all year, which is a hundred percent true. Um. Like we've been calling them the most Jekyll and Hyde team in the league, like all year. Um, but like, who in the East hasn't been hit and miss all year? Like, DC has five wins. So does Nola also has five wins. Like, it's everybody's been hit and miss. Um, you, I was honestly, I was gonna take. I think I was gonna take DC, but now that you've taken them, I think I'll go with Nola. Ah, fickle you. Are. Yeah. Nola, it is. Next up, we have Toronto versus Houston. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be going with the Arrows. Uh, I think obviously Houston did were able to get that victory last week, but at the same time, letting Chicago come within 
uh, a losing bonus point range as well as allowing Chicago to get the try bonus as well. I think there's opportunities for Toronto here that they really need to be able to get. So I think that with home advantage, I think Toronto should be able to get this. Yeah, be a lovely Saturday night at York Lions Stadium. And uh, the Arrows, you know, put a little bit of a wrinkle in the Eastern Conference playoff race by uh, drawing D.C. and Atlanta, you know, um, a few weeks back. So uh, I- I'm looking forward to seeing if they can uh, do a little bit of damage and uh, cause some chaos in the West. So, um, yeah, Toronto, Toronto all the way. Uh, next up, Chicago will be hosting San Diego. Uh, one team confirmed to make the playoffs and one team definitely eliminated. Um, Who you got? I say this as though it's not an obvious. Yeah, I was going to say it's um, I would I would say the San Diego Legion. uh, Yes, the San Diego Legion are going to win. Also, I have nothing for this. The Legion are going (laughs) to win the game. Like, yes, like yeah. There's there's no analysis really, really needed. I think. Uh, Yeah, I've got to agree with you there. I'll be picking San Diego. Next up, we have New York versus Dallas. Mm. So Mm. that's the thing is that before Dallas's victory over Atlanta. (laughs) I would have said New York, but now mm. in this strange reality we live in, I'm not so sure anymore. I think that New York, you know, they they were up against the best in the West, so it's hard to really gauge. But you know what? Let's have a little bit of fun. I'm gonna go with Dallas, and I mean, I've already I'm already behind in the. Uh, <laughs> picks this year so what's another wrong choice gonna be ah uh, man i love that pick for you um yeah i i think i'm gonna take new york just again mainly because you took dallas but i love the fact that you took dallas in this game i think this will be a new york i think this will be a lot of fun new york's new york's obviously dealing with their own injury situation as well um they got a lot of uh quite a healthy no- or quite a solid amount of guys out and you know Dallas it'll be interesting to see cuz it's like Dallas gets they had a bye week last week so this is their first game since the the win over Atlanta um it'll be interesting to see if they can kind of keep that momentum going forward um New York again Nobody in the East has really been that great. They only got, they got six, they're six and seven. So um, it'll be a, uh, I don't know. Like I want to take New York because that's what the brain is saying. But I feel like the heart's going to say Dallas in this one, but I, I'm going to stick with New York though. We'll stick. Should be a fun game though. And the final game of the round an all Western affair, but this is probably going to be the game of the weekend. Seattle versus Utah. One team trying to secure their conference final spot. Another team trying to secure that they can make the playoffs and have that locked in. Which team, Derek, do you think is going to be the more determined to win? Oh, man. Uh, th- yeah, I think this is the game of the week. Obviously, there's the NOLA DC game in the East, which is going to be, which has huge playoff implications, but. Um... Like I said, though, Nolan and DC uh, kind of combined have 10 wins. So Seattle has 11 on their own. So it's a little feels like there might be a little bit of a different level of uh, play on display in this game. And I I'm going to take. I don't really know. Like I want I, I like Utah. I like the way that they've been playing. They've been they've seemed to be building, but you also got Seattle at home. So that's it's a tough toss up. Um. I think I'm going to give my edge to Emerson Pryor and the Utah Warriors, though. All right. Well, just because you said Utah. Yeah, that's fair. That's I fair. am going to pick Seattle. You know, I think having Penny and Watkins, that's two Canadians. That's an extra Canadian more than Utah. So mathematically yeah. speaking, they should be winning from Very this cool. but yeah. but obviously we don't know the team list when we're recording this is being recorded on 29th of may so 
Who knows? Yeah. Anyway, those are the games of round 16. Atlanta versus New England. NOLA versus DC. Toronto versus Houston. Chicago versus San Diego. New York versus Dallas. And Seattle versus Utah. And you can catch all those games on the Rugby Network, with the Arrows games being hosted on TSN, TSN TSN.ca, the TSN app, and TSN+. Plus. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out more, as well as our written pieces on our new website, therougerugby.ca. You can also find our podcast on Spotify, S4P, and Apple Podcasts. We also have a YouTube channel, at The Rouge Rugby, with episodes of the podcast, as well as extra interviews with players and coaches in our black box videos. Make sure to like and subscribe, and hit the bell notification to stay up to date with all our videos. We're also available across social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, all at The Rouge Rugby. Derek, where can the fine people find you on social media? At Percept the Jet uh, across all social media platforms. And uh, as per usual, we'll be at the Arrows game on Saturday night. And you can find me across social media at Hardman, spot H4RDMAN. And we'll see you at York Lions Stadium. Well, that's where we're going to end this episode. Derek, thank you for joining me. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Rouge Rugby Podcast, where we talk about real Canadian rugby. We hope you can join us again next time.